All right. So thank you for all for joining us today um, for this webinar. I'm really excited that we have our guest today, Sammy. Um, this is someone I've known for a while. Um, I remember years ago, I got a zine that Sammy made that was all about identifying plants in the wintertime. And um, so when I was developing the webinar series this winter and trying to figure out who would be a good guest, I thought they were one of the first people who came to mind. Um, and I'm really glad that they get to share some of their knowledge with you there. Um, they know an awful lot about uh, botany and uh, they're someone who's really good at appreciating um, the small things in the landscape that are often overlooked. Um, so yeah, I'm really glad that they could be here today. Um, so we are the Oak Ridges Marine Land Trust and uh, this is one of our uh, webinars, our winter webinar series. And we'll talk about a few of the more that we have coming up soon. Um, so I'd like to begin today with a land acknowledgement. So um, where I am situated today is in Toronto, um, but I understand that we're all gathered um, from different places across the lands known as Ontario, uh, which is home to many diverse uh, Indigenous First Nations people. But where I am in uh, Toronto is the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Wendat, and the Haudenosaunee people. And today it's home to many diverse Inuit, Métis, and First Nations people. So um, the Oak Ridges Marine Land Trust, um, sometimes people don't, uh, don't uh, fully understand what a land trust is versus um, you know, a conservation authority or other things like that. Um, we're all about land. Um, most of the marine is privately owned. It's a very significant uh, geographical landform across Southern Ontario that extends from uh, around Brampton to south of Rice Lake out in the Port Hope area that was formed by the glaciers about 13,000 years ago. Most of it's privately owned. Um, we work with landowners to help protect uh, the ecosystem and the habitat. Um, most of our properties are conservation easements, so people will still live there and they might farm there or have their house there, but uh, part of the property is protected as habitat for wildlife. Um, and we use lots of different tools. Um, some, some of the properties we own uh, with uh, different other stakeholders, like the Beaten Heritage Forest, some of them we own outright. Um, and uh, part of our strategy is to offer protection beyond legislation. So there's an extra level of protection uh, to help make sure that threatened species like this Blanding's turtles here have um, places to live in the province. Um, so as I mentioned, it's a uh, land trust is a type of nonprofit. It's a charitable organization that acquires land uh, for the purposes of conservation. Um, we raise money. Um, to help purchase land, we do conservation easements, we protect the natural heritage features of the properties, and uh, we receive donations from lands. Um, and we protect all these sites in perpetuity. So if you donate um, your farm to us, we will protect it forever. We will never sell it to a developer uh, or change our mind somewhere down the road, <laughs> which is great. Um, so we uh, contribute to the federal government's goal of protecting uh, natural spaces, uh, we connect people to nature, um, doing educational programming like what we're doing right now. We support climate change resiliency. We protect green corridors between natural areas. And um, with your support, we uh, we protect uh, ecologically significant features near, on and near the, farine, the marine. Um, we also, important to mention, the Ecological Gifts Program, which is something the federal government organizes. And it's uh, a program for landowners uh, that gives them tax breaks for donations and conservation easements. So it's a really great deal for you. You get to protect uh, wildlife and natural spaces, and uh, you can stay uh, where you live, but um, you get you get uh, a little break on your taxes um, if you agree to one of these easements or um, to donate your property, um, your will. Uh, right now we're working on Kirtland's Warbler Habitat Restoration. This is a super exciting project. I'm a big birder. Uh, my supervisor, Eileen, is a big birder. This is a really interesting bird that's endemic um, as a breeding bird to the Great Lakes region. It has very specific habitat needs, and um, most of them are found in Michigan. A few of them breed in Wisconsin, and every once in a while one will breed in Ontario. Uh, we have a property in Northumberland that we're restoring to meet the needs of this bird, uh, but it's going to help a lot of other species at risk too, like the eastern meadowlark, short-eared owl, um, the uh, eastern hognose snake, things like that. Um, and so we have a program right now for people age 55 plus to collect seeds of native species to help with the plantings there. 
Uh, and we have uh, we have a link here for um, volunteer registration, um, which um, Holly, my co-host, will throw in the chat. And uh, I'll show you, we have some exciting webinars coming up related to that. So we have on February the 12th, we have a volunteer orientation session for that. Um, and then on the 13th, we have uh, an introduction to native trees and shrubs. On the 20th, we have one about wildflower identification. And then our friend Sammy is going to be back on the 27th to lead one about native grasses. So if you've ever wanted to learn about big blue stem uh, and other uh, fan favorites, uh, this is a great opportunity. All right. I will. Um, yeah, I will go to the presentation. Amazing. Thank you so much for the lovely introduction. Um, unfortunately, I've had some technical difficulties. Uh, but we're going to bring you as many winter weeds as possible. Um, so yes, my name is Sammy Tangier. Um, I'm really, yeah, really grateful to be here. I'm coming to you from Michisagi Anishinaabe territory. I'm in Warsaw today at a friend's place. And um, yeah, we're going to dive into it. Uh, and soon it will be up on your screen. Yeah. Me one uh, second here. I love plants in winter, but I am not a wizard on Zoom, and that in combination with a new computer and, and whatnot has led to some challenges, but thanks for sticking with us. Um, I guess I'll start by saying that, um, yeah, wow, it's amazing that you've taken time out of your day to come and listen to me talk about plants in winter. Uh, what a wonderful gift. Um, and I just want to say that I am not an expert on plants in winter. And on plants generally, I am a person that is enthusiastic about plants, um, but I never went to school for any formal botany of any kind. I've just followed my curiosity and learned from friends and other people I know that know about plants. And um, really, I think the, the most important and notable thing is taking time to stop in our tracks and notice the details of the plants. Um, mm -hmm. Sorry yeah. to interrupt you. Would you be able to throw that link in the chat once more? Yeah. Let me. I've closed that, but it won't take long to open it. One moment. Da, 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 da. Oh my. Do, do, do. Cue the fun music. Plants in winter are so great. They are so nice on the background of snow. Here we go. <laughs> Thanks for sticking with us, folks. Okay, here it is. And I'm sticking it in the chat again. Thank you so much. No um, problem. We'll <laughs> and There's we will this. be able to pop into this. All right, yes. Um, yes, it's hard to do things uh, on the internet. It would be nice to be out there in the winter when, on unseasonably warm winter with you all. Um, okay, so this was the plant that was on the poster and it's a very beautiful one. Um, and you can just, you can just like click through. Maybe I'll, I'll make like a thumbs up motion. If oh you yeah, want. that works. Yeah. Okay, great. So, well, this plant, if anyone's familiar with is Dame's Rocket. Um, and we're gonna, we're gonna dive in a little bit deeper, but yeah, let's keep going. Next slide. Okay, so. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with doing this, but I really recommend that if you're excited to learn about plants in any season, the most important things to do are to really get in touch with noticing the details of the plants. Um, so whether that's feeling them, noticing the texture, even the smell, I point out this plant because they, um, they have a really lovely smell. Uh, this plant is, well, we can go to the next slide. Do, do, do. Yes, this is Monarda um, or wild bergamot, bee balm, a really wonderful plant, a wonderful prairie and savanna um, native plant species. Um, and uh, taking the time to, yeah, to taking the time to be with them to really notice their details is going to really help you. Um, and if you can just go back and just stay on the Monarda for a little bit longer. So um some things to ask yourself when you're wandering out around in the winter and you see a plant um i like to think okay what what does the stem look like what does it feel like what are are there any leaves that are still around and if there are if they are um what are their branching patterns um so these are all some really cool questions we can ask and 
I will say we can go to the next we can go to the next photo um that one of the things that's really important and I always like to bring up is just some of the hazards that exist. Um, and this plant, though, is really beautiful. Uh, a good friend of mine brought a bundle of these berries inside a uh, winter ago, exclaiming that they'd be so lovely to put in a winter arrangement. And I, very horrified, was like, no, no, please. <laughs> well, go wash your hands because this plant, if you can go to the next slide, is poison ivy uh, so I would say really like interact with all the plants but be mindful that there are some that could cause and well there are very few actually there's few plants that you're going to really rub against that are going to hurt you in the winter but poison ivy is one of them um, and it's a real treat to get to see them with their berries and also to notice their the shape of their buds because um, in the winter is a really nice time to uh, walk through spaces where otherwise you might not be able to in the summer with all the leaves of poison ivy and, and to notice that they're there and just kind of keep track of that for your future adventures. Uh, the other one plant that I wanted to point out that really is is not a huge <laughs> it's not a huge risk for you unless you're putting your putting plants in your mouth which I this is not a talk about foraging and I would just recommend that if you're interested in that it's an awesome thing but Number one, number two, number three rule is don't put it in your mouth if you don't know what it is. Um, and this plant, my friend sent me this photo, is, um, we can go to the next slide, is related to this plant, which other people might be familiar with. If, if anyone knows at any point you want to chime in in the chat uh, what plant, plant this is, um, they're both in the same plant family. They can look a little bit similar. These ones I noticed. Yeah, yeah, thanks, Chris. It is wild carrot. Queen Anne's lace, yeah. Um, so these plants are both in the same family, but we can go to the next slide. Um, but that one is water hemlock, and that is a really poisonous plant um, and one that, yeah, we don't want to be eating, uh, or I would even avoid touching them just to be safe. Um, all right. Yeah, and then we have Queen Anne's Lace. So I wanted to start uh, by talking about this plant. Um, and now you might be noticing that I'm not saying the names of the plants right away, and this is intentional. This is me trying to um, really encourage you to notice the details, because sometimes we'll put a name on something and then we'll forget to look closely. Um, we'll be like, oh, we checked that off the list, it's over. Um, so this plant is one of the plants that got me really excited about plants in winter. Um, because it just looks so unique and I was seeing it all over the place and I I wish I could tell you that I had some succinct way of finding it but I think I probably searched like plant in winter time looks like it has bell-shaped flowers um, and eventually I learned that yes this plant uh, you got it Michael is evening primrose you can go to the next slide um, yeah, so this is a really awesome plant and it was really cool for me because I had met this plant in winter and I had never ever seen them in the summer. And so eventually, after some searching, I found them in the summer flowering and that was really cool. Um, but just because of how distinctive their flowers are, the shape and the feel, um, they really stood out to me and that, I feel like that's a really important thing about taking the time to notice plants in all seasons is because when we do that, it's an opportunity to build a relationship with those plants um, and understand that, yeah, some of, sometimes they stick around. Sometimes you'll notice a plant in the summer and it's almost impossible to find them in the winter. And this is just a really intriguing thing about our local environment. Um, okay, so I wanted to say that I, I really wish that I had some sort of formula for you, like here, here's everything you need. These are like the check, check these things off the list and you'll be able to identify your plant in winter. Um, and unfortunately that's not the case. Um, I find that just generally it's hard to identify plants. Um, but one of the most unique things about, about plants and what I've learned to identify a lot of plants with is, um, is by their flowers and by the color, the number of petals or parts that they have. And in the winter time, those pieces aren't always there. Um, so for me, I learn plants in winter by a, a, a few different tactics. So noticing the things that stand out to me. And one thing that's really helpful is understanding the plant families. Um, so botanists have grouped plants together by their different similar or di different characteristics. Um, 
things like how their leaves are arranged, how their flowers look, how many petals or parts the flowers have. Um, and so if you're ever looking up a plant, you can also look up the plant family. And I find it's really helpful to take note of that as I'm learning my plants, uh, because then I can kind of see the connections between plants that I might think are quite different, but then I'm able to learn something that kind of interconnects them all. So let's scroll through these photos. Um, and Maxwell, if you're able to zoom in on one of them as like close as you can to the flower, that would be awesome. Um, because these plants that I'm showing you here, they all have these little fluffy flowers. Um, <laughs> kind of like uh, if you think about the fluff of a dandelion, but smaller. Um, and actually they're in the same plant family as the dandelion. It's okay if you're not, not yeah, able to. I don't think I can, <laughs> sorry. That, that's all good. Um, okay, so yeah, we we'll scroll down to the next one. Yeah, so some people might recognize this plant and as well, um, if we if we zoomed in there, if we were able to put our faces really close, like I hope you do outside, um, you would notice these small little flowers with little fluffs. Um, and yeah, we can go to the next one too. Amazing. Yeah, so yeah, we can just keep scrolling. So these plants are in the aster family. This one's our New England aster, which has the really beautiful, noteworthy purple flowers in the summertime. Uh, the next one is our heath aster, which has the little white flowers. Um, and what's helpful and what, what how I'm able to ID these is, is really by noticing that oh, the, like their flowers are kind of similar. They have something similar going on here. And I have been building relationships with these plants throughout the season. So I'm able to kind of connect the, connect the dots a little bit and be like, oh, I remember that the leaves of this one are very, very tall or very, very small. Um, and then we have, oh, Celebrity Canada Goldenrod. This one I'm sure you've seen on the roadside looking really bright and yellow in the late summer and early fall. And they're a really easy one to find in the winter time. You also might notice they have, uh, sometimes they have the goldenrod gall where there's an insect that's injected their larva into the stem. Ooh, uh, that's an exciting and interesting thing to see. Okay, yeah, and then we have our forest goldenrod. This is zigzag goldenrod, one that sometimes holds onto the leaves. I find I, I see very few leaves left in the winter time, but um, if you're wandering through the forest and you see a little floofy, flower heads, perhaps it is our zigzag goldenrod. Okay, now I'm gonna give a shout out to this at another awesome plant. People might know this one. Um, the Their seed pods are really distinctive. Uh, and let's scroll to the next one. So this is another plant that is related to that, that photo right before. Um, and if I was able to zoom in, I would zoom in for you. Um, but both these plants are in the same family uh yes milkweed yes 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 and the other plant is dog strangling vine so related to milkweed but um, a plant that is is a great great competitor and um, a, a big challenge to biodiversity um, especially in projects that i've been involved in and in this landscape um, and winter time is a really awesome time to just be noticing these things because sometimes in the summer there's so so much green going on um, so if you're able to see these dog strangling vines and take a note of them in the winter you can come back and try and try and care for them and remove them in the spring and summer another really cool plant family that we've all maybe even ate recently is this one you can look at this photo and the next one um anyone anyone got a guess on these Da, da, da. It's okay if you don't. I the things that I yeah not asparagus, but other really delicious and not for vain, but yes, good good guesses. <laughs> um, I find that these mm, <laughs> yes 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 this is a mustard. So I find that the plants in the mustard family they all have these kind of distinctive seed pods that are usually a little bit long, elongated, and in the winter time. It's like a silhouette of those, those seed pods. Um, so we have pepper grass, and then we also have James Rocket again. Um, garlic mustard looks quite similar. Um, I find that the pods are shorter. Um, I would say like a third, a third to half the size or length of the James Rocket pods. Um, yeah, 
But this is an opportunity, if you see those, come back in the spring and see if you can watch that plant grow and see who they turn into. Um, another way to notice plants in the winter is to uh, check, a take a look at your clothing and see if any plants have stuck to you. Uh, so people might be familiar with this one. I love this plant so much uh, uh, in certain spaces. It's, yeah, it's a real treat to dig them up and get to eat their delicious roots. Yes, this is bird. Um, so these seeds might have stuck to you. They are the plant that inspired Velcro. So cool. Um, this is another one. I don't know if people have seen this one. Oh no, I am. Um, I think it's in the next. If you can scroll to the next one. Yes. Okay. I'm glad I edited this all a little bit more recently and wanted to in include the photo of these seeds. I don't know if anyone's ever got these seeds on them, but um, I feel like I had never known who this plant was, where they were, but I would come home and I would have all these seeds all over me. Um, so this is beggar's ticks. Um, and they just have these really distinctive seeds that will love to stick onto you. Uh, if you encounter this plant, oh, I'm gonna be so excited because this is an awesome prairie plant, uh, amazing native plant that also has very sticky seeds, our showy tick tree foil. Um, that, yes, awesome. Okay, and then this one too, another sticky seed. Um, their seeds are quite, yeah, quite a cool shape. This is Enchanter's Nightshade. Um, and yeah, these are all seeds that are very likely to stick to you or your dog. So if you, even if you are done your plant walk or done your walk outside and you notice these on you, it's an opportunity to be cur curious about what's stuck to you and, um, mm hmm so another way of interacting with plants in the winter is, and kind of solving, sleuthing the mystery of, of who you're seeing is to consider where are you? What kind of habitat are you in? Is this a wet place? Is this a dry place? Are you on the side of the road? Um, and so these two plants are plants that I've seen in quite wet places. Um, so these are the fertile fronds of da, 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 our ostrich fern and our sensitive fern. Um, yeah, really awesome plants. And um, if you're spotting them, you're definitely in a place that is a lot wetter. Um, another plant in a similar habitat we have next is, da, 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 this one is a really beautiful, there's some really beautiful um, cultivars that people put in their gardens, um, verbena or blue vervain, um, really awesome plant. Uh, and one that also loves to be in those wetter spots. So if you're spotting that plant, then yeah, that could be a clue to you. And same with this one, it's hard to tell the scale from these photos. Um, and, I, and I, in some ways did that for fun uh, because it's fun to be challenged, but uh, this is a very large, large plant and one that I really associate with roadside ditches and, and just noticing places where the water is flowing under the under the road. That's where I see Joe Pye weed. Um, and yeah, they're, they're kind of big umbrella flowers sticks around all winter long. Mm -hmm. Now this is a neat one. Um, it's really, I, I feel so happy for you if you get to encounter this plant. I really love these and um, the habitat they grow in is usually a very healthy a forest understory where you might find some blue cohosh. Mm -hmm. um, okay, and now, um, these are some of the most common winter weeds that I see and find and even notice as I'm driving down the road. Um, so the one in, this, in the background of this photo, um, oh, it's chicory. And you'll notice what I find distinctive is just the way that the flowers are arranged on the stalk. Um, in these little clumps and yeah we're just gonna keep on moving great um this is another one and if if you were there in person i would really hope that you would feel the stem of this plant and notice that it's square yeah chris this is so feel hooray um so this is a plant that i've seen in the forest kind of the edge edge of forest but also in lawns um, really amazing plant medicine and really cool plant to get to see. Um, and it's in the same plant family as this plant, the next plant here. Um, 
this is one that if you encounter without knowing, you might be like, ouch, <laughs> it's a bit sharp. <laughs> and if we, if we were to be able to zoom in, you'd also notice that this plant too has a square stem. And so just to go back to our plant families, it's, it's nice to know that um, these are both in the mint family. So if you are out there in the world and you discover a plant with a square stem, that doesn't always mean but it, there's a good chance that it could be in the mint family as that's one of the characteristics of that plant family. Um, okay, and then this is, this is, a, really, this is a really common one. Um, there's, these are two different um, types of the same, same group of plant, our common plantain and narrow leaf plantain. Um, these ones you'll find in areas that are walked on all the time, get like super compacted. Um, and it's fun in the winter time. I like to see if I can find seeds. And the other day, I, I knocked some seeds off some of the common plantain and noticed that um, they had turned all gooey because they are they have like a mucilage to them. They're related to um, I'm blanking on the name right now, but to a plant that people really often use for digestive things, di digestive needs. <laughs> um, oh yes, okay. I'm gonna speed through because we don't have too much more time, but. Check out, this is like a monster big plant. Um, it really stands out, looks very tall and strong. This is a common mullen, um, really distinctive seed head, really like out there. Sometimes there'll be multiple, but often I just see them alone, um, one stalk. We're just gonna, yeah, we, we got our, our St. John's word. I wanna skip to the bottom because I really wanna talk to you. Um, Although I just want to give a shout out to this plant and, and finish on this plant as a really, oh, you oh, wait, 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 stop. <laughs> thanks, thanks. Um, this is such a cool plant. This is an, an a hopeful seed and an adventure potential to find this plant out in the world. Um, this is Eastern skunk cabbage and it does this really cool thing. Um, this is a native plant and it does thermogenesis <laughs> where it, can warm its surroundings over 20 degrees higher. Um, so it, it makes a hole out of the snow and enables uh, itself to be one of the first things that's pollinated by flies and, um, and other, yeah, other pollinators, but mostly flies in this very beginning of springtime. Um, so that's a really fun one to watch out for um, and also grows in wetter spaces. Um, yeah, we're a real favorite of mine and one I'm always excited about um, finding each year. And then I just wanted to close it off with pointing out some really wonderful resources. This book by um, Lauren Brown is pretty much what I've been talking about the whole time um, with some really incredible illustrations of plants in winter and just like the uniqueness of their silhouettes and how they stand out. Um, similarly, the Nature in Winter by Stokes is, has a really nice se uh, section on plants too. Um, and then I also have made some zines and whatnot about plants in winter. And I'm, I'm just going to think I'm going to put that in the chat for you all if you want to access them. I have some online versions. Um, and I, yeah, please, please use them and enjoy them. And um, yeah, and I really hope that this was a little seed of something exciting to encourage you to take the time to just stop at a plant that you're seeing outside in the snow and be curious about them, feel their stem, smell their seeds, um, and see what you might discover. And if you're ever lost and you want some winter plant ID help, you're welcome to reach out to me. I'd be very excited to talk to you about plants in wintertime. Um, and I, I see that we're at our, our 1230, so I wanted to just express some big gratitude to have the opportunity to get to hang out with you all and chat to you about plants in winter and, and also to say that there's so, such immensity of, of knowledge and stories about every single plant um, from the traditions I know and from tra traditions beyond me from the, the First Nations folks that are here um, in Michisagi Anishinaabe territory and all across Turtle Island. Um, so this is just a little seed, and I really hope that this is a seed of inspiration to, to dig deeper and to learn more and connect with the plants around you because it's really a wonderful thing, and I think it presents an opportunity for us to care and be stewards of the land, just like the Oak Ridges Moraine Land Trust is, is working towards doing and, um, and doing lots of. So, yeah, thank you all, and um, yeah.
Thanks, Maxwell and Eileen. And, and maybe I have I put this photo of the grass here. This is bottle brush grass. Uh, maybe if you're excited to hear more silly plant stories and see some fun photos of grasses and whatnot, uh, you can join me in a few weeks to learn about some native and non-native grasses that might be around you um, and are definitely uh, awesome grasses for the Kirtland warbler and other um, birds and creatures that love the prairie and savanna habitats. Mm -hmm. yeah, thank, thank you so much for, for that presentation, Sammy. That was that was wonderful. And it's your enthusiasm is just so palpable. Um, <laughs> it's so nice to see somebody, you know, so excited about common mullein and all these things. Um, I will say that um, skunk cabbage is one of the worst smelling things in the world, but it's a kind of a fascinating smell. There's something kind of sweet to it as well. I remember you encouraged me to smell it a while back and I I messaged you to be like, I finally smelled it, and it's so strange. Um, yeah. Anybody has a um, a question? Um, mm -hmm. No. Um, if we have a, we want to spend a little bit of time answering some questions. Yeah, I'm not in a rush to go anywhere, but um, I just wanted to close off in case folks were stopping in on their lunch break. Um, yeah. Trying to think if there's anything else I wanted to tell you all about. Aileen was wondering if you could identify the difference between some of the non-native and native uh, plants that you talked about. Or totally. Which ones are yeah. So, um, so yeah. <laughs> How to put this? A lot of the so a lot of those roadside. I'm just gonna look at my presentation kind of in the other window, but a lot of those roadside plants, um, the chicory, selfiel. Selfiel, motherwort, those are those are not native plants. Um, common plantain, also not native, but there is a native plantain that I, I see quite often and looks very, very similar. Um, blue cohosh is a native one. All those wetland plants are native plants. Um, the burdock and the bigger sticks, those are European plants that are just quite abundant in our in our area. And same with, same with the dame's rocket and the garlic mustard that we talked about. Um, yeah, I, I really just threw, threw them all in here, but all those asters that we talked about too. So the Heath aster, the sky blue or the New England aster, the Canada goldenrod, the zigzag goldenrod, those are all native um, asters. Um, evening primrose is also native and it, it's cool because I always thought that that plant was, was not a native plant. So I was happy to learn that. Um, Devin has a question. Yeah. They were saying, yeah. what are some ways to get connected with other people who are interested in nature? That's a great question. I think I think put it, putting it out to the world, putting it out to the people in your community, and, and even if you take the initiative yourself to say, hey, I'm, I'm going to go for a walk today in this park. Does anyone want to come with me? I want to look at some of the plants. Um, it's OK if you don't know anything, but just taking the time to be out there. Um, You'll, you'll be learning and um, and being in touch with groups like the Oak Ridges Moraine Land Trust. Um, there's lots of awesome events that are happening through through the seasons. Um, and you can also look into your local local land trust, local naturalist communities. Um, I, if anyone's in Toronto, I am part of a group called the Wild Foragers Society. And on occasion, we run a like, totally free community. Let's just go look at plants together, wander. Um, yeah, field naturalist groups are awesome. Mm -hmm. Let me ask if they have any uh, winter bark. Winter bark. Ooh, that's was asking, hard. Someone was I asking have... about the two books you recommended. I'll put the names of them in the chat. Yeah, um, that would be awesome. Thank you. Um, yeah, winter <laughs> bark is so hard, um, but I do believe that it it is helpful at times. Um, it just can change so much as the trees are growing. I know that there is a book on bark, but unfortunately, I don't know the name off the top of my head. Um, but maybe if you do some searching, Ontario bark ID or Eastern North America bark ID, maybe you'll find something. Um, yeah, I, this is it was hard to just focus on on flowers uh, for this, but uh, winter plant or winter tree ID is a real real dear love. <laughs> Um, and that's awesome that you're eating burdock and uh, 
Wow, cartoons. Nice. Yes. Um, yeah, I'm all. I'm a big fan of eating the weeds and. Um, yeah. Thanks for putting that in there. Mm -hmm. Well, someone wants to see you do one on, on tree ID. <laughs> That'd be fun. It's, yeah, it, it would be fun. Unfortunately, um, in, in a little bit of computer um, challenges, I had made a nice slide for you all on um, just the, the difference between the branching patterns, which I can illustrate with my body a little bit. It's, the screen's too small. But um, if, you, if you scroll up in the chat, I put in there a link to a little booklet I made on trees in winter. And that has a really nice page in it about the, the branching pattern. So like our opposite, our alternate, our world around the world. <laughs> um, and that, that's in the trees in winter, if you click on there. Um, it also has the fun acronym. That's a really helpful way to um, to just keep track of what trees are oppositely branched because that can really help you. There's not as many trees that are, that have an opposite branching pattern um, as ones that are alternating. And these are all just like little, little pieces of clues that can help you figure out um, who you're looking at. Someone is asking about uh, slide 62. I can, I can share the screen for a second if you want. Mm -hmm. Which species do we have here? Oh my gosh. Okay. So I put this in here. I feel embarrassed. I put this in here. I took this photo a long time ago and I actually, I thought, and I had in my notes that it was lady slipper and I don't think that I am correct. And I don't feel like I know who this plant is. Um, and I'm going to say that that's okay. And perhaps it's an opportunity for me to dig deeper. Um, I find that when I have a plant mystery, it's, it's, it's a real catalyst for learning. Um, and in putting this presentation together, I wasn't sure if we'd get to this one. So, <laughs> um, so yeah, I wanted to just point out that I don't know everything and I'm learning. This was in a wetland. A part of me thinks it's an iris, but I don't know. And if you know, I would love to hear from you. That's amazing. I feel like a lot of um, birders in particular have a lot of trouble admitting when they don't know something. So it's really refreshing and, and really nice when, when people are able to yeah to, to hold that i make mistakes mm -hmm. all the time and there's so many things i don't know especially with winter trees um so yeah it's, it's totally nice to yeah and just just like to be okay with that and and also use it as motivation to try and learn and try and seek out resources and on occasion i'll search like silly things in google to see if i can find something when i'm not able to to think about what 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 plant does that look like to me is a question I'll ask. Like it looks a little bit to me like an iris, something that has a large flower head. Those are the things that are going through my mind. Um, and then what of those things grows in that habitat? So perhaps there are lilies there. Um, Sammy, that is uh, lady slipper. I don't know which one, but it is. Yeah, you had it right. Yeah. Yay. Okay. Okay. I see. I could. Like, Look at I you. It was a while ago, so I couldn't remember my thought process. So I, I and I felt like oh, I need to verify this before I share it. So thank you. And I tried to I tried to search it up before this, but I, I just could, couldn't figure it out. So I'm glad. Um, and it's a really neat thing too to encounter a plant um, in the winter time that you've never seen any other part of the year. Um, that was how it went with me in prairie lily, which actually looks quite similar to the lady slipper. It's just like a stalk with a large seed head. Um, and that was really cool to notice in the winter time, um, and then eventually see the very incredibly beautiful um, orange flowers in the summer. Mm. Yeah, thanks for IDing these folks. That's awesome. All right. Well, if we don't have any more questions, I think we might wrap it up and let people finish their lunches. But I just wanted to thank you again, Sammy. That was that was one of the best nature presentations I've ever. Um, been a part of and I'm so glad you could be here today to, to share your knowledge and your enthusiasm and yeah to encourage people to get out there and start asking questions and using their senses and you know feeling stems and smelling things and um, just not poison ivy yeah just not poison <laughs> ivy yeah legally um, we don't touch poison ivy um, but yes thank you so much everybody for joining us today it was uh, an amazing presentation and um, yeah mm -hmm. we, we hope to see you at some of our future ones and as we mentioned earlier, at the end of the month of the 27th, Sammy will be uh, teaching us about native grasses, which is a, a really fascinating topic. Um, yeah, thank you all.
All right. Thank you all so much. And I hope you have a wonderful day. If it's sunny where you are, I hope you get to feel that sunshine.